الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله ما بعد أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما أرسلناك إلا رحمة للعالمين وقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لا لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى أكون أحب إليه من من والدي وولدي والناس يجمعين أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام respected brothers and sisters today I will be talking about a very important figure in the history of Islam and the reason why he's important is not because he was a military general or a, a conqueror or a king he's not important because of that because in history we have had plenty of kings generals and uh, conquerors you know some of them were far bigger than Salahuddin. Sultan Salahuddin Yusuf bin Ayyub was born in Iraq, current day Iraq, in Tikrit. He was Kurdish by descent. And the reason why we are talking about this person who lived almost eight centuries ago, 800 years ago, and he cr frequented the land of the Middle East or the Levant, also known as Levant, you know, the Middle East, the land of Syria, the land of Hejaz, and the land of Egypt. So, this man is important because he had a very different character, a very different legacy to leave behind than all other kings who have lived in history before. He was a special man. So before the 19th century, every land almost was governed by kings. They were generals, they were conquerors, they were administrators, you know, they taxed people, some fairly, some unfairly. So we have our history full of kings and conquerors and generals, right? Yes? The entire history of humanity is full of them. But why are we specifically talking about this man today? Why is he so special? When it comes to conquests, we have many people who came before him and made huge conquests. One of them was Alexander the Great, who started from Macedonia in Europe, and he went as far as Pakistan, conquering lands. He covered Europe, he came into Egypt, conquered some parts of Egypt. One of the cities is named after him, Alexandria or Iskandria. And then he went into the Middle East. He conquered parts of Iraq, Iran, then into India at that time, Hind, and went as far as Punjab. And he was very young. <coughs> Within 10 years, he was able to conquer the largest chunk ever conquered by one person in the entire human history and he's called the great he's called the great because of his conquest not because of his character not much is known historically about his character what we do know is not very positive then we have other conquerors afterwards we have people like Napoleon people like Hitler you know people like Stalin people like Mussolini yeah King Leopold, who killed over 10 million people in Africa not very long ago. Many people are known for either good deeds or for bad deeds, right? Most kings, most generals are known, not known for goodness. So one of them who is of good character, because it is very difficult for you to be a general and for you to be a king with that much power in your hand, Immense power. It is a lot of power. You know, when you're a king, you are effectively a dictator. You can do what you want with your people. And in some cases, in fact, in a lot of cases, people did oppress. Kings did oppress their masses or their subjects. So it is a huge burden and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to not make us kings. Yeah? Why? Because it's a huge responsibility. On the one hand, you can be very very fortunate if you become a king you govern 
people with Islam, with justice, with compassion, your reward is very, very big. Subhanallah, because the bigger the responsibility, the bigger the reward. Right? And we should ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to not give us big responsibilities because if you are not able to fulfill those responsibilities, then you will be held accountable. So, when there is a king or there is a general, there is a ruler who was of good character, who was merciful, who served the cause of Islam, we remember them for that reason. Because they did not serve their stomachs or they did not serve their desires. Rather, to the contrary, they sacrificed everything for Islam and for the good of the Ummah, for the Muslims, or to defend the truth, to defend the oppressed and oppose the oppressors, oppose the aggressors. And we have many examples like that in our history. You know, we have people like, you know, of, co of course, uh, Khulafa, who succeeded the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said about them, Alaykum bi sunnati wa sunnatil Khulafa al-Rashidin al-Mahdin min ba'di. Upon you is my way and the way of my successors who are rightly guided. They are not only al-Rashidin, they are al-Mahdi'in. Okay? So they are rightly guided. And about them, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, He guaranteed for them that they will be upon virtue. And in another report, we are told that they will be about for 30 years. So we have Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, and some scholars even <coughs> had Hassan bin Abi Talib, uh, Hassan bin Ali bin Abi Talib also uh, within the Khulafar Rashidin. So these people were guaranteed, their characters were guaranteed by the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Those who came afterwards, their characters were not guaranteed, right? But their generation was good. For example, in a hadith, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he stated, خَيْرُ النَّاسِ قَرْنِي ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ أَوْ كَمَا قَالْ عَلَيْهِ صَلَاةُ وَسَلَامُ That the best of people are my people, my generation, Ashab Rasul, and the ones that come after, and the ones who come after. So these are three generations, Ashab Rasul, at tabiun and their followers, Taba Ta'in. Okay? So these are the people who the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, praised and he said these people will be of good character generally speaking generally of course there were individuals among them who were not who didn't meet the standard but generally speaking the bigger picture Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi said their lives will be full of virtue they will be a people of Sunnah they will be a people of the Quran as far as the believers are concerned and you know when we start talking about kings Amr bin Abdul Aziz radiallahu <coughs> anhu Rahmullah, he was one of those people who only governed, governed for two years. Now we have many people before him, many people after him, right? So we have the entire history of Banu Umayya, for example, right? Banu Umayya begins with Muawiyah radiallahu an, then his son came to power, Yazid bin, uh, bin Muawiyah, and he governed for four years. Then comes Marwan bin Hakam, after Marwan comes Abdul Malik bin Marwan, then comes Walid bin Abdul Malik, then comes Suleiman bin Abdul Malik, then comes Umar bin Abdul Aziz. And after Umar comes Hisham bin Abdul Malik, and the list goes on. And in the year 132, Banu Abbas comes to power. We have Safa, we have Mansur, we have Al Mahdi, we have uh, Harun, we have Mamun, we have Muqtasim, all this. So, out of all these people who were generally good people, they were generally good people, they were good kings. They did good things. They did a lot of services for Islam. They definitely made mistakes, no doubt. But out of all of them, Umar bin Abdul Aziz, Rahmatullahi alayhi, he is known with special regards. Why? Why? He only governed for two years. And there were others who governed for long periods. This man only governed for two years. From the year 99 to 101. 
and some of the ulama they believe the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam about uh, when Adi bin Hatim was with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam speaking to him said, "You are shocked about the security situation in Jazirat al Arab. There will come a day if you live long enough that a woman from Hira will come alone on a beast and she will make tawaf around the Kaaba. She will go back unmolested, untouched. She will be completely secure. You know, this is how security will be." In Jaziratul Arab, if you live long, long enough, you will see it. And then if you live long enough, you will open the treasures of Kisra. And Adi bin, you know, Hatim, he was shot. Huh? Kisra? <laughs> Subhanallah. He was, he wanted to know which Kisra is this? He said, Kisra bin Hurmuz, Ya Rasulullah. Because he wanted to confirm that the Prophet, you know, the time the Prophet is speaking to him, the Muslims don't even know what's going to happen the next morning, yeah? Yeah. You know about the story of the, the ditch when they were digging the khandak, yeah, and the rock came and Rasulullah was striking the rock and he said, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, sparks emerged and the third time he struck the rock, the rock broke. And then he said, the Sahaba, they asked, Ya Rasulullah, why did you say Allahu Akbar? Now imagine, he is digging a ditch. For what? For what? Anyone? Defending, Defending Medina. Medina from who? Sir? <laughs> Sir? <laughs> from the Qureshis. Yeah, how many Qureshis? About 3,000. Yes, almost, but more than that. <laughs> okay, they were almost, some according to some reports, 10,000 or maybe some states, some reports state 24,000. Uh, a coalition of 24,000. Ahzab is also called Ghazwatul Ahzab because many. You know, Ahzab is the plural of Hizb. Many armies came against the Muslims. <coughs> so he's digging a ditch and they don't even know if they will survive. You know, the Sahaba, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu he has the Sakina. He knows Allah has promised him success. He will succeed. But the Sahaba, you know, they don't have the Iman of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They don't have the Wahi. Yes? So, when he's digging the ditch, he said, Allah has told me that you will conquer the Arabs. And they're listening. Yes, Ya Rasulullah. And then he said, you will conquer the Persians. And you will conquer the Romans. So this is, these are a people who are besieged. And the Messenger of Allah is telling them this will happen. You know, there were Munafikun among them as well, you know. There were hypocrites from Medina among them, right? They said, they were like, <laughs> this, this person is, Audhu Billah, lost his mind. He doesn't know what's going to happen the next morning, whether they will survive or not. And he's telling us that we will conquer Arabs and the Persians and the Byzantines. So, likewise, when Rasulullah sallallahu said to Adi, who was still a new Muslim at the time, that we will, you will open the treasures of Kisra. He said, Kisra bin Hormuz? It's like me telling you that a, a village from Bangladesh or from a village, uh, a village from Al Jazeera or Morocco, one of the small villages, will conquer China. Yeah, what would you do to me? You would take me to a doctor, right? Yeah, you would take me to a psychiatrist. <laughs> yeah, right. But Adi, he said, Ya Rasulullah, Kisra bin, you know, because this was the large, one of the largest armies in the world, and the Arabs at the time, the Muslims were very few. And he said, Yes, Kisra bin Hormuz. He said, Okay, Ya Rasulullah, if you say so, I believe it. You know. And then he said, if you live long enough, you will see, you will be looking for poor people, but you will not find them to give them charity. You will have so much wealth. You will be so rich. So, Adi bin Hatim states, I saw a woman come, make tawaf and go, secure, completely secure. I was there when the treasures of Kisra were, were open to my, uh, you know, uh, shock, basically. And I'm sure those of you who live long enough, you will see the third prophecy fulfilled. You will be looking for people. And that happened in the time of Umar bin Abdul Aziz. <coughs> Scholars testify it happened in the time of Umar bin Abdul Aziz. So, Umar bin Abdul Aziz is known because of that. Likewise, Sultan Salahuddin al Ayyubi, also known as al Ayyubi, the founder of the Ayyubid dynasty. Uh, it should be called Yusufi because he was Yusuf, right? Yusuf bin Ayyub. But the dynasty is called after his father, Majduddin, Sheikh Majduddin Al Ayyub, right? So he was Yusuf bin Ayyub, 
Salahuddin, also known as Salahuddin or Saladin in the West. He was special like that. He was a king who had a lot of power. He didn't start as a king. He start, started as an ordinary soldier, but became a king. Became a king, a general, and he had a very powerful character. He was very interested in Islam. He applied Islamic values when he governed, and the result was absolutely amazing. That's why he is remembered. There were kings before him, there were kings after him. Right? He is remembered because of what he did with his short life. <coughs> he was born in the year 1137 or 38. In the year 1137 or 38, when the Muslims were already fighting the Crusaders. Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi, Rahmatullahi Alayhi, is known for his services with regards to uniting the Muslims. The Muslims were completely disunited. In this age, Muslims were completely disunited and they were all worried about their small petty states here and there. Some people became concerned. They realized that this disunity <coughs> is destroying us. The Crusaders are not stronger than us. Who were the Crusaders? The Crusaders were mainly Knights, knights means warriors, okay? They were warriors who had come from Europe. They originated from different nations in Europe or different tribes. So this process started in the year 1095 CE. 1095, when Pope Urban II, the Catholic Pope, he organized a meeting in the city of Clermont in France. He asked all the Christian knights he could gather. Knights means barons, warriors, or leaders. It meant a, a number of different things in Europe at the time. These people, knights, were usually the ones who had uh, enough means to buy armors, buy horses, and have possibly some other men with them, you know, riders. Because horses were very expensive at the time. Armors were very expensive at the time, you know, the chain mail. Have you seen it? If you go to a museum, back in the day, to protect themselves in war, they used to wear chain mails, you know, uh, a dress or, or, or kameez, maybe a shirt made of chains, right? So if someone struck you with a sword, the chains would block the sword, the blade would you know, not penetrate and you would not get cut or injured. And that was very expensive. So knights were usually people who were knighted by the king of the land to give that status to him and he could then accumulate wealth by that. And one of the things they did with the wealth was to buy weapons and buy means. So in Clermont, Pope Urban II had gathered knights, barons, leaders, you know, or feudal lords, because Europe at the time was under feudalism. These people were invited by Pope Urban and he delivered a speech. Now many historians actually doubt the speech or even doubt the meeting. <coughs> many historians doubt whether the meeting actually ever took place. And there are four versions of the speech we have in different four different chronicle, uh, chronicles coming from the Middle Ages. But to put it in a, you know, to, to summarize the speech, if it's a historical, he is thought to have talked to the barons and the knights. And he said to them, you are all fighting each other. Why don't you go and fight the enemy? Unite, go and liberate the Holy Land. Jesus Christ is buried in Jerusalem. Holy Sepulchre, the church where he's uh, thought to have been, uh, you know, uh, buried or his tomb is thought to be there. You know, uh, he's not buried, of course, Jesus ascended to the heavens, but it's considered to be the tomb of Jesus Christ. Yeah, this is where Jesus, uh, you know, it's, the Holy Sepulchre is the place where he was put for three days and he rose uh, from dead, basically. This is what the belief is, right? So go and liberate that place, the Holy Land, from the hands of the infidel. Who is the infidel? The Muslims. 
or the Saracens was another word used, okay, or the heathen, or the pagans. You know, the Catholic Church, reading the early chronicles, they used words like this for the Muslims, you know, infidels, Saracens, the heathen, or the disbelievers, okay. So all these words were used for Muslims. So he said, why don't you go and fight them? And he lied about the condition of Christians in the Muslim lands. He said, Christians are suffering. And Muslims torture Christians on daily basis. And he depicted certain situations, imaginary situations, he imagined from himself. If the speech is historical, if the speech was actually delivered. So this is what we find in the speech. So people became very aroused. They said, okay, we must do something. Lo and behold, suddenly you see a massive rush of people, you know, uh, making their way towards the Holy Land. Al-Quds or Jerusalem, right? So there were a number of different crusades, a number of different parties left from different places. Some came from France, some came from England, some came from Germany, some came from Poland, okay? So, uh, you know, a lot of people had joined and then there was a crusade of people. A lot of peasants, people, farmers, you know, who were living in villages, they packed their bags and said, okay, yallah, go, bismillah, on the road. Thousands of them, thousands, <coughs> led by a monk called Peter. So this was called the People's Crusade. Then some knights, army men, generals, leaders, soldiers, they also left. Right? The people who left, majority of them perished in the way. They died. They were either killed by hunger, by starvation, sometimes by the weather, sometimes by the robbers and attackers. So when they crossed Anatolia, I mean, very few of them made it that far. But Anatol you know what Anatolia is, yeah? Anatolia is a Turkish, you know, uh, territory. You know, um, it's, it has Central Asia? No, not Central Asia, sorry. Asia Minor. It's also called Asia Minor. Central Asia is uh, the other part, you know, where Uzbekistan, and Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, that land is called Central Asia. So, when they reached this part, they could not survive. Most of them died. And in fact, the Crusaders, the soldiers also died. So, only 13,000 of them, in the year 1099, they made it to Jerusalem. 13,000 of them. So, from 1095 to 1099, how long did it take them? Four years to reach Jerusalem. An army, an entire army. So, majority, 60,000 left, according to sources, only 13,000 survived. Most died. Even soldiers. Even soldiers. People, they perished. People were massacred on the way. Some uh, by the Turkic tribes as well in Asia Minor. So what happened to these 13,000 people? They were fighting for life and death, you know? So they had nothing to lose. So they fought valiantly. Um, the city of Jerusalem fell to them and they massacred the entire population. They killed everything. Not everyone, I am saying everything. According to the sources, the Crusader sources, the Jewish sources, the Armenian sources, as well as the Muslim sources, because we have different sources of the Crusades, right? They killed everything. Even animals were killed by them. And Ibn Lathir, rahmatullahi who was a historian writing in 1220s in Musul, who wrote the history of Crusades, and uh, you know, he had access to early sources and uh, early people. He writes that almost 70,000 people were killed in Jerusalem. And some of the poets, they lamented in the mosque of Baghdad. They went to the Khalifa in Baghdad and they cried in the mosque of Baghdad. Like what's happening in Syria, you know, today? Yes? What's happening in Syria? Hundreds of thousands of people have been killed, thousands of dying and people are lamenting, you know. There are so many ulama, there are so many scholars, so many people who are actually concerned about the Ummah, who really, really feel for the people of Syria, they lament. Likewise, Khoits at the time, you know, they went to the mosque of Baghdad and at the time of Juma, you know, they lamented the condition of the Muslims. And Imam Ghazali was actually alive at this time. You know, Imam Ghazali died in the year 1111. 1, 1, 1, 1. That's when Imam Ghazali, Rahmatullahi died. He was uh, also in Baghdad, if I'm not mistaken. 
but there's nothing known from him. We don't have anything, any commentary from him on this incident. So, this was a very disturbing event and the Crusaders had occupied Jerusalem. Now they were governing Jerusalem and slowly and steadily they took a lot of land around Jerusalem. They started to attack Muslim states. Muslims are already divided. You know, in Egypt we had a Fatimid Caliph who was Shia. You know, Fatim, he didn't really care about the Sunni Muslims who were dying around the world like what Iran is doing today. It's very similar. You know, Iran is actually involved in Syria. Iran is killing Muslims in Syria. Right now as we speak, Hezbollah is there. Right? So, Fatimids didn't really care. Actually, they allied with the Crusaders in some cases. When it suited them, they allied with the Crusaders. So, who was left to defend the Muslims? Who was left? A family of Turkic tribes, Seljuks, uh, um, sorry, Zangids, who uh, were a family who originated from Mosul. Mosul is in northern Iraq. They rose to power and one of them, he decided that he must do something. So in 1142, uh, he started to fight back. Imaduddin Zinki, or Zangi, also known as Zangi, you know, he fought back the Crusaders and he took back some cities, right? He took back some settlements from the Crusaders. The Crusaders now realize that there is organized opposition from the Muslim side, right? So these people grew in power. While he was the ruler, Imaduddin Zinki, of this territory between Mosul and what was taking place in the, in the Middle East, um, the father of Salahuddin, in, uh, he was um, the ruler or the caretaker of one of the castles. So he gave refuge once to the Zinki army. Okay? And because of that, he became very close to Imaduddin. So, when Imaduddin Zinki died, Nuruddin came to power, his son Nuruddin Zinki. Nuruddin Zinki was a lot more religious than his father Imaduddin. Imaduddin was the one who initiated the opposition against the Crusaders, also known as Sulebiyin. You know, Suleib means the cross. And the word crusade actually comes from the cross. Crusade means the war of cross, or Crusaders mean the, warrior of, the warriors of the cross. Okay? So, Imaduddin was not a very religious man himself, but Nuruddin was deeply interested in religion. And we know that from the fact that the amount of waqf, you know, madaris, and uh, orphans he sponsored. To this day, if you go to the Mishk, I mean, you can't go to the Mishk. I have been to the Mishk in the year 2010, before the war I was there, and I was walking around in the streets of the Mishk, um, or oh, it's called the Mashk, also called the Mashk. You, you know, people pronounce it differently. So, I was walking around in the streets of Damascus and there is a, there's an old graveyard, you know, it's called Babu Sagir, the graveyard of Babu Sagir. Who's been to Damascus? Anyone? You've been to Damascus, yeah? You know the graveyard, Babu Sagir, yeah? Are you Syrian, by the way? No, I'm not Syrian. Okay. So, I was there for only two nights and I thought to myself, I cannot go without looking at this graveyard. I mean, I don't want to go there to seek blessings or anything like that, you know. But I wanted to see the graves of these great people, you know, who's buried there? Ashab Rasul are buried there. For example, uh, you know, uh, Bilal al-Habashi, Bilal bin Rabah, you know, he's also buried in this graveyard. Uh, Abu Barda is also known to have buried in this graveyard. Then we have people like Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah is there, right? Many, many Tabi'een and uh, their followers are also buried. It's a huge graveyard, yeah? So I went there at 9 o'clock uh, at night and it was pitch dark and there were two brothers with me from Birmingham. And I said, Ikhwan, we're going in. And when they looked at the graveyard, they said, we're not going in there because it was so dark. And we looked to our left and we saw a grave and it stated on it uh, his name... Uh, it stated Al Maruf Ibn al Qayyim al Jawziyah. Imam Ibn al Qayyim al Jawziyah was buried right at the door of this graveyard. So he was there, you know. So I saw his grave. So uh, Damascus, you know, a lot of Okaf. When I was walking around in the streets, I saw buildings, you know, Waqf, for example, from the Zengi time, from the time of the Crusades, very old buildings. So Nuruddin Zengi was a very generous man like that. So he came to power and he continued the fight against the Crusaders. He continued to defend his people against the crusading aggression 
who came from the West. And they were very barbaric in their ways. Crusaders were simply a very barbaric people. Muslims at that time were the most civilized people on the planet. How do we define civilization? Uh, what do I mean by they were civilized, right? So they were civilized because Muslim mannerisms, you know, the way Muslims lived, they used to have baths, they used to have soaps, they used to have sugar, they used to have sweets, they used to have books, they used to have libraries, they used to, Muslims used to be educated, there were hospitals, there was a flourishing society. You know, Muslims were generally civilized and they treated each other very nicely, people generally were very good to each other, you know. But when the Crusaders came from Europe, they didn't have these qualities. They were simply a bunch of, you know, uh, uh, wild people. They were very wild. And Osama ibn Munqid, who was writing at the time, who was alive at the time of Sultan Salah al-Din was, 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 was also a warrior, um, and he was a poet, he was a writer. And he wrote a book called Kitab al um, which means ibar, you know, when you take lessons, a book of lessons. In this book, he wrote many, many interesting things about the Crusaders. He observed the Crusaders very carefully. Now, he is a man writing when Sultan Salahuddin al Ayyubi is alive, and the book was even dedicated to Sultan Salahuddin al Ayyubi. And he died a few months later after the Battle of Hittin, when Sultan Salahuddin al Ayyubi defeated the Crusaders. He died a few months after. So he depicts the Crusaders. He talks about Osama ibn Munkid talks about the Crusaders and he explains how the Muslims are different to the Crusaders or how the Crusaders at that time were so different to Muslims. So that was the situation of the Muslims. Muslims were very civilized at the time and they had been invaded by this outside, uh, uh, you know, like the Mongols came later on. The Mongols were very barbaric. They were hardly civilized and they destroyed everything that came in their way. Crusaders were not much different. Crusaders were not much different when it came to their dealings with the Muslims. So these people had to defend their people. So Nuruddin Zinki he started to defend his people. So when the Fatimid uh, Caliph or Khalifa in Fatimid Egypt who was Shia, Al Adid uh, or Al Adid, when he had problems, he asked Nuruddin Zinki for help. He had some political issues some problems within Egypt and this was a good gesture for the Muslims as far as the Muslims are concerned this was a good opportunity for, for them to take advantage so when Nuruddin was asked by Al-Adid to send help to support me against my opponents Nuruddin sent Shirku Shirku was the uncle of Sultan Salahuddin Al-Ayubi and Sultan Salahuddin Ayubi at the time and this happened in the year 1163 CE. 1163, when Nuruddin Zinki sent Shirku, who was a Kurdish general, to go and help Al Adid and support him. And the intention was to remain in Egypt. Don't leave Egypt. Don't leave Egypt. Once you get in there, once you establish yourself, you are a representative of, of a Sunni power because Nuruddin Zinki was Sunni. Right? The Fatimid Khalifa is Shia and they posed a threat to the Muslims of the region because they were a very powerful state and they often allied with the Crusaders. So they posed a threat to the Muslims. So this is why Nuruddin made this move. He took you know, advantage of this opportunity. He sent Shirku. With Shirku went his nephew, young nephew at the time. How old was he? Almost 26 years old, 25, 26 years old, Yusuf bin Ayyub. Now I've already told you he was born in the year 1137 and he was born to his father Najwaddin al Ayyub and he grew up in this military household, you know. He was used to do this military system uh, and he belonged to a Kurdish tribe and these Kurdish tribes had already become Arabized. You know what that means? You know. They spoke the Kurdish language, but their culture was very Arabic. They had adopted the Arab system. Nowadays, unfortunately, these Kurds we find in the Middle East are very secular. They don't want anything to do with Islam, majority of them. Very few are Islamic, very good people. But, you know, this issue of Kurdistan, which is a big menace for the Turks and for the Iranians and for the Iraqis and the Syria, because this whole region 
It's called Kurdistan and they want a separate state and uh, a lot of them are actually communists. You know, they have uh, no connection to Islam. They don't want... Uh, this is a new generation we're talking about. And this is a new development, by the way. It only happened in the 20th century when all these things started to happen. Kurdish people were very religious, you know. Major, when Salah Abdin al Ayubi rahmatullahi was Kurdish. And people afterwards, you know, they looked up to him as well. So, he belonged to this family, which was already allied to Imaduddin Zinki, as I already stated earlier. Najmuddin al Ayyub, who was the father of uh, Sultan Salahuddin, was already allied to uh, uh, Imaduddin Zinki. Now, Imaduddin has died. His son Nuruddin is governing. He sends him in 1163 to Egypt. So, Shirku goes to Egypt. So does Salahuddin. So what happens? They fight some battles in Egypt. They establish themselves very powerfully. You know? So they start to fight crusaders, they start to fight the enemies of... And they become very close to Al-Adid. Al-Adid was the caliph of Misr, Egypt. And their intention is to eventually take Misr from these people. Shirku and Salahuddin are there, you know, paving the way for Muslim takeover of Egypt. So in 1169, having fought few battles, Sultan Salahuddin al Ayyubi has made his name already in battles because he actually helped his uncle fight battles. So there were times, you know, in, in those times, how did they used to fight battles? You know, uh, they used to have an army, and in the army you had foot soldiers and you had the cavalry. You know, cavalry? People on horses, knights. Yeah? So they used to have uh, Maimana, which is the right. And they used to have Yasar, which is the left, and they used to have Kalb, Kalb in the middle. So, generals usually used to have three parts to the army. One is the extreme right, on the right, and that would be led by a known general, someone who's been tried and tested, yeah? The left would be given to the left rank, okay, or the left side of the army, or the left part of the army would be given to another general, and the Kalb was usually led by the most learned, the most experienced, the best of them, okay? So, Shirku, when he fought battles with Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi, he would give him responsibility either of the right or the left, or sometimes even in the Qalb, in the middle. So, Salahuddin became battle-hardened uh, throughout his career in Egypt. So, he became very experienced, having fought the Crusaders, sometimes having fought other factions who were fighting the Fatimid state at the time. So, now, in 1169, Shirku, according to some sources, over ate. He ate too much and he died because of that. Maybe he had food poisoning or something happened to him. He died. And after his death, Al-Adid, he liked Yusuf bin Ayyub, who is Salahuddin Al-Ayyubi, very much. He loved him very much. He liked him. He trusted him. So he appointed him as the Wazir. As the Wazir. So who is the Caliph? Al-Adid. Yes? So he appoints Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi, who is not Sultan yet, he appoints him as the Wazir. So in 1169, Salahuddin becomes the Wazir. How old is he at the time? He was born in 1137, 1169, he's almost 32 years old. 32, very young man, okay? So he's the Wazir. So now when he becomes the Wazir, he starts to establish his power. He starts to gather his power, he starts to form alliances, starts to build his power to remove the Fatimid dynasty altogether. Because he knew, Nuruddin Zinki in uh, Syria knew that this is one of the biggest day more than these people are more dangerous than the Crusaders. Because they are an enemy from within. So until they are removed, we have no chance against the Crusaders. So this was a grand plan devised by Nuruddin Zinki and Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi was part of it. Right? And he was, as far as he was concerned, he was an appointee uh, or appointed um, <coughs> general of Nuruddin. And, you know, the Fatimids, after Shirku came into Egypt, even asked him to leave. Take 30,000 dinars, you know, leave. He said, no, I can't leave because I've been told by Nuruddin to stay. So he stayed in Egypt for that reason. And they became very powerful. So in 1169, Salahuddin became wazir and he starts to remove power slowly from the Fatimids. He starts to appoint his own people in high positions. And then, in 1171, Al-Adid died. Al-Adid died. Now Sultan 
Salah al-Din Ayyubi came out openly and he said, Khalas, end of the Fatimids, now I am the ruler of Egypt. So he appointed himself as the ruler of Egypt and he had his own army, so he established himself. There were rebellions, he crushed them, okay, and now Nur al-Din Zinki was in a very strong position. Very, very strong position to fight the Crusaders. So Syria belongs to him, Egypt belongs to him. Because in Egypt is his, not nephew, uh, ne uh, Nuruddin Zinki was not the uncle of Saladin, that was Shirku. Nuruddin was uh, Turkic, uh, but he was not Kurdish. So he was the ruler of Mosul. So now both lands effectively belong to the Muslims, Sunni Muslims, right? So the Crusaders are now stuck in the middle, right? Where are the Crusaders? Egypt on, on this side, because Nuruddin knew, he knew until we take Egypt, we can never defeat the Crusaders because the Crusaders played games. They were playing games because when the Crusaders found themselves cornered, they would ally with the, the Fatimids. Fatimids being Shia dynasty, they would happily ally with the Crusaders against the Sunni powers because they felt threatened. Uh, they were threatened by the Sunni powers of the region. So now Egypt had come to the Sunnis. So 1171 Sultan Saladin and there were times when Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi from Egypt and Nuruddin from Syria would attack the Crusaders together. Now this was a big problem for the Crusaders. What do they do? They are stuck now in the middle. It's like, you know, a sandwich. Yeah? What happens? So they found themselves in a very difficult situation. And Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi actually became more powerful than Nuruddin. But there were disagreements between them at times. Uh, Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi never openly opposed Nuruddin Zinki never openly went against him. There were times he disagreed with him. But in 1174, Nuruddin Zinki died. Nuruddin Zinki was a very pious man, very good man, very good leader of the Muslims, with a lot of good uh, history, you know, and deeds. He died. Now Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi, Rahmatullahi they couldn't trust his successors. So his 19 years old son was appointed as the ruler. He couldn't trust his successor. Because this unity they had formed, or this plan, which had been uh, accomplished uh, came about very, um, you know, in a very difficult way. They had to struggle a lot and he couldn't possibly lose it. So what he did was he immediately attacked Syria to take it. So he started to fight the Zingids, you know, and Zingids were pushed away as far as Mosul. So they went back to Mosul, Sultan Salah Abdina Ayyubi by 1182 CE. It took him about seven to eight years to conquer the land of Syria. So he took Aleppo, he took Hama, he took Homs, um, um, and he took a lot of the land that belonged to the Muslims at the time. He even sent armies to Yemen. So effectively, by 1180s, by 1180s, and what, what is he trying to do? He is simply trying to unite the Muslims to get rid of the crusading menace. Can I have a cup of tea? With one, one sugar, please. Yeah. So he is trying to get rid of this menace, right? And he knows it is impossible for him to do until he <coughs> unites the Muslims under one umbrella, under one flag. And amazingly, he did not declare himself to be independent. At no time, Sultan Salahuddin al Ayyubi rahmatullahi declared himself to be independent. At all times, he expressed. It's, uh, his um, 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 he expressed that the caliph in Baghdad um, was Al Mustadi was his leader. So at no point he challenged the caliphate in Baghdad, right? When we use the word caliphate, unfortunately, what comes to mind now, uh, ISIS. Yeah. So we're not talking about a caliphate like that. Banu Abbas, the caliphate was different. So if someone adopts, uh, um, you know, a title, doesn't make you one. If I, for example, start to call myself Sheikh al-Islam, do I become Sheikh al-Islam? No, I don't become Sheikh al-Islam. If someone uh, on the street claims to be a prophet of God, you know, prophethood is a very noble concept, yes? Yes? It's a very noble concept. If someone claims to be a prophet of God, he simply doesn't become... Uh, a prophet of God just just by looking like a prophet, you know, they have an image of Jesus in churches, for example, yeah, Jesus with the white robe and long hair and blonde and blue eyes, yeah. Someone starts looking like that, Abdurrahim Green, for example, yeah. 
Yeah, you know Abdurrahim Green, have you seen him? Mm -hmm. If he comes on the street and says, I'm Jesus, yeah? I'm the return of Jesus. Would you believe him? Just because, because someone claims something doesn't mean that they are actually qualified to be that. You have to fulfill the criteria. You have to fulfill the standard which is established by the Quran and Sunnah. So if someone claims to be caliph, someone or some group claims to be caliphate, they have to fit into the Islamic infrastructure or Islamic uh, model, right? So Al-Mustadi, who was the caliph in Baghdad, Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi, even though he actually became more powerful than the caliph, you know how much land he eventually ended up governing? He became the ruler of Egypt, the ruler of Hejaz, the ruler of Syria, and the ruler of Yemen, and also some parts of North Africa. So imagine his power. Let me repeat. He became the ruler, sole ruler of Egypt. Egypt was the most powerful country at the time. You know why? Egypt had the river Nile. The river Nile was the source of life in Egypt. Subhanallah. You know, even today when you fly over Egypt, have, has anyone flown over Egypt from another country? Yeah, I have. When you look down from the plane here, you see a line. What is that line? That line is the river Nile. And on this side and on the other side, all you see is green. And after, you, after green, you see immediately red sand. Allahu Akbar. Completely red desert. Nothing there. There is life just because of the river. Just because of the river. So Egypt was the breadbasket of the Muslim world. You know, there was a lot of harvest. Even today, you know, uh, a lot of things come from Egypt, you know. Farming is uh, a huge business in Egypt. So, Egypt could supply armies. You know, even in the Roman time, Egypt was very important for the Romans because they could bring in a lot of provisions from Egypt. So, Egypt was very important. He governed Egypt, he governed Hejaz, he governed uh, Yemen, he governed Syria, and he governed some parts of North Africa. This was an empire, a dynasty with Sultan Salahuddin you know, Ayyubi, a simple man who came from Tikrit, didn't even want to come to Egypt. He hated Egypt. He really wanted to be in Damas uh, Damascus. He wanted to be with the ulama. You know, this was a young man. As a young man, he was very much into sitting with the ulama, learning from the ulama, talking to the ulama. And even when he became the general and the king, he was surrounded by the ulama. In fact, some of his biographers, one of them, the top biographer of Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi is a man called Bahauddin Ibn Shaddad, who was a sheikh, who was a scholar, who advised Sultan Salahuddin Al Ayyubi on matters. So every time something happened, he would turn to the shiuch, he would turn to scholars. What, 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 should, what do you want me to do here? You know. So he gave a lot more importance to the ulama than to his generals. So he was from a very young age inclined to religion. He was interested in religion. He was from a very young age a moral man, you know, and when he became the ruler, whatever weaknesses he had in his character, you know, because part of the culture was at the time, there were certain things that came with the culture of ruling class, you know, when you become to, uh, belong to the ruling class, you know, certain things come to you with the culture of that ruling class. So he abandoned all of that. Just like Omar bin Abdul Aziz, the story of Omar bin Abdul Aziz, when he became the Khalifa, yeah, he abandoned everything. Yani all the things he used to do because he belonged to the ruling class. He belonged to Banu Umayyah. He belonged to the ruling family, you know. So because of that, a lot of things came with that culture. So when he became the Caliph, he told his wife Fatima. Fatima was the daughter of Abdul Malik bin Marwan. She was the daughter of a Khalifa. She was a princess. Fatima, the wife of Umar bin Abdul Aziz, was a princess. He tells her, now my life has changed. If you want luxuries, if you want necklaces, if you want gold and glitter, I will divorce you. I will leave you. But if you can live the tough life I will live, by all means. She said, I choose my husband over all the ease of life. She abandoned all the easy life, you know, subhanAllah. Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi, likewise, he abandoned all the ease and he became a very simple man. And we have examples like that. Uh, in Islamic history, which we must discuss and talk about, people like uh, 
the Mughal Emperor Aurangzeb Alamgir, you know, he was far more powerful than any kings, Muslim kings before him. Mughal Emperor Aurangzeb Alamgir, who governed from the year 1658 to 1707, 49 years, he governed one of the largest chunks of land in the world. He was the owner of the 25% of world's wealth. You know what that means? Aurangzeb, there is a, there's a lecture available online uh, in Arabic by a sheikh in Saudi Arabia. I, I don't know his name. Uh, what is the sheikh's name? He talks about history very often. Musa yeah. Sharif. Sorry? Musa Sharif. Musa Sharif. I don't know if he's... He's a young sheikh and he talks about history and he has discussed this topic in Arabic as well for the Arabs. Aurangzeb Alamgir because the Arabs are not aware of him. You know, they don't know much about Indian history or what happened in India, what happened in Hind. He was a pious king like that and when he became the king, he abandoned all the luxuries and all the ease of the of his life. And we have people like uh, Tipu Sultan, for example, in the south of India, he governed from the year 1782 to 1799, very, very pious Muslim king who did a great, great uh, services to Islam and we, we must talk about them at one point, inshallah ta'ala. Everyone knows Sultan Salahuddin al Ayyubi, right? Yeah? Everyone in the Muslim world from Morocco to, uh, to China, you know, the Muslim province of China, you know, Uyghur people, you talk to them of Sultan Salahuddin al Ayyubi, they know him. But hardly anyone knows about these individuals who are very often neglected in our history. We should tell our children about people like Aurangzeb Alamgir, people like Tipu Sultan, and other unknown characters in Muslim history who did great jobs. Some African characters, you know, uh, uh, King uh, uh, Sultan Uthman uh, Don Forio, he did great things for Islam and Muslims. <coughs> Hardly anyone knows about him. So we must have a comprehensive view on history, inshallah. <coughs> so coming back to Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi, he was, uh, when he united Hejaz, Yemen, and Egypt under his power, now he was able to fight the crusaders effectively. Now the crusaders truly feared him. They knew now they are in big trouble. Now this is a big problem for them. Because now one Muslim ruler has united so many Muslims under his rule. And he has become more powerful than the crusaders. Cut the long story short. In the year 1187, Sultan Salah al-Din al fights a decisive battle against the Crusaders having united all Muslims or most Muslims in the Middle East under his command, he fights the Crusaders a direct battle in a place called Hittin or Hatin, also known as Hatin. And this battle took place in July 1187 and the Crusaders were uprooted, crushed, completely destroyed decisively. And this was the last nail in the coffin of the crusading rule in the Middle East. So the crusaders started to lose territory after that and eventually it took them another century to leave the Middle East but they never gained a strong foothold in the Middle East after this battle, after this defeat. And immediately after this defeat, in the month of October, Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi laid siege to Jerusalem and the city of Jerusalem surrendered to him Firstly, he did not accept any terms from the Crusaders. He said all people are safe except the Crusaders. The Crusaders, who were the Crusaders? These were the biggest enemies of Islam and Muslims. We know them today as Templars. The Templars were not spared by Sultan Salahuddin al Ayyubi. After the Battle of Hittin, many people were left. You know, many people were free, no problem. Yet, there was one particular class which was truly Islamophobic. They hated Islam and Muslims. And they were fighting Muslims just because they hated Islam and Muslims. They had no other reason, right? They were not spared by Sultan Salahuddin al Ayyubi After the Battle of Hittin, they were lined up and they were executed by Sultan, by his orders. And in some cases, he used his own sword, you know. And in some cases, he told some of the shiuch, you know, to come forward and do the job because they were always, you know, uh, teaching but he said this is these people are the biggest problems for Muslims in Islam they have oppressed so many Muslims they have killed so many Muslims one of them was Reynold Reynold de Chateau uh, who was one of the French knights who um, governed a castle called Kerak has anyone been any, anyone been to Jordan uh, Jordan you've been to Jordan wow mashallah okay so 
We have a place in Jordan called Muta, where the Battle of Muta take, took place. Not Muta, or not Muta, it's Muta. Okay? In this place, Ashab Rasul fought the Romans, and right next to this place, this town of Muta, there is uh, a castle not very far from it, about 10 kilometers, maybe less. It's called Kerak, and it is on top of the mountain, and it is a very scary site. I have been to it myself. And it is known that Reynold captured Muslims, Hajjaj pilgrims, passing through his territory, captured them, put them in prison or in these dungeons. And he said to them, call Muhammad to rescue you. Now, where is Muhammad now? What's happening to Muhammad? Yet he was taunting Muslims like that. You know, we have many examples like that today happening to Muslims around the world as well. You know, in Guantanamo, stories I heard and things like that. Well, this was, you know, Quran was flushed down the toilet too, to mentally torment the Muslims. Similar things were happening at that time. He said, where is Muhammad? Call Muhammad. And when Sultan Salahuddin al-Ayubi heard about this, he said, this is a man, he's a king now. By now he's the king. He said, this is a man I will execute with my own hands. Okay, I won't use the executioner for this, this man. And that's what he did. But anyway, cut the long story short, the city of Jerusalem surrendered to Sultan Salahuddin al-Ayubi. Uh, Balian was one of the leaders in the city of Jerusalem. He said, if you do not spare the lives of the crusaders, then I will kill all 5,000 Muslims in the city and I will destroy Masjid al-Aqsa, I will destroy all the sites. Sultan Salahuddin al-Ayubi, he made mashara with his uh, people, his generals, and they said, give him his terms, let them go. Uh, all we want is peace for Muslims and the city. Khalas, the city surrendered and many people were freed. Ransom, very little amount was appointed as ransom for the people and it was easily paid by the bishop. Uh, and Malik Afdal, Malik Al-Afdal, who was one of the brothers of Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi, he specifically asked them, give me 1,000 captives. Sultan knew what he was going to do with them. He knew he was going to free them immediately and they were freed. And in some cases, Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi from his own pocket paid the ransom for the people to be freed. Freed, And he told the crusaders, and their families, you are free to live in Jerusalem in peace. And if you want to leave, go back to your lands. I will escort your people in my under my security, under my army, to the coast. And then you can go back to your lands. This is how merciful Sultan Salahuddin al Yubi Rahmatullah was. And he even spared the king, Gidu Lusinion. He spared him, he let, let him go. And that was a mistake he made, he should not have let him go. He let him go because he promised that I will never come back and fight the Muslims. And same thing happened, he came back and he continually fought the Muslims and he caused a lot of trouble afterward. Karen Armstrong, who is one of the scholars who has written on Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi, she states uh, that Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi was merciful to a fault. You know, when you are merciful, but when you are merciful to a fault, you know when your mercy starts to hurt you, basically. When you start to be so merciful to people, they start to hurt you. He was like that. He was so merciful. Rahmatullah And having talked about his services, in, in the year 1193, having taken the city of Jerusalem, he, Rahmatullah alayhi, passed away. You know, so Allah had appointed him for a job. He came and he did the job very nicely. He was a man of a great character. When he died, he only had one gold coin and 47 dirhams in his personal treasury. Even though he was the king of Hejaz, king of Yemen, king of Egypt, the richest land in the world possibly at the time, he only had one gold coin in his personal treasury. He spent over 15 years or 14 years of his life on the battlefield. He did not see his children. He did not have the normal life you have at home. He was out there defending the Muslims against the Crusaders for 14 long years. Once, Bahauddin ibn Shaddad narrates that he received the news of his nephew's death in his tent. He told his people to leave him alone. Yani go, leave him alone. And when they left, he cried like a baby. He didn't want to cry in front of them, he didn't want to show them weakness. He cried like a baby because he couldn't be there in, uh, on, uh, at his janazah. So Bahauddin ibn Shaddad comforted him and told him, yani, this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, you have to be strong and when he had taken the city of Jerusalem He was himself in the city when Richard the Lionheart the king of England and France came to take the city back It took him one year to get to the Holy Land and when he came he besieged the city of Acre Akka also known as Akka 
and in Latin or in English is known as Acre. So when he besieged the city, he took the city by force and there were 3,000 Muslims in the city. So he, Richard, told Sultan Salahuddin, raise 200,000 dinars, 200,000 gold coins was a lot of money. That was possibly billions at the time. Or I will kill all 3,000 of them. And Sultan Salahuddin Ayubi rahmatullahi was running around trying to raise funds and still at the same time fight. And you know, before this city was taken, he besieged this place for two years. Two years to defend the Muslims of the city against the Crusaders who were on the other side. Two years a battle was fought for one castle, one fortress, where the Muslims were besieged inside. It was a very difficult situation, very difficult to explain. For details, read the books and you will see exactly what happened in this place. Okay? For two years he was besieging and his people, his army, his generals were saying, come on, leave it, leave this place now. It's too much. We have done what we could. And he said, no, there are Muslims inside. I will not leave them alone. I will not leave them to crusaders. And when the city was taken, Richard slaughtered 3,000 Muslims in one day. 3,000 Muslims. Richard, they call him the lion heart. Only Allah knows whether he was a lion heart or what heart. But he did that. And he, after taking the city, made his way to Jerusalem. And he was a very, very effective fighter. Very tough guy. He, even the Muslims acknowledged his strength. Bahaudin ibn Chaddad narrates that on one day in the battle of Asruf, he ran the entire length of the Muslim army with a javelin in his hand, challenging all the Muslims. You know Mubariza, challenging all the Muslims and no one came forward to fight him. This is how scary this character was. Richard, this is how scary this character was. So even Bahaudin ibn Chaddal, he acknowledges the strength in the opponent. So Richard was a very effective leader, very effective ruler. He was respected by his army a lot. So for that reason he was able to fight all the way up to the city of Jerusalem. Only six miles away, he stopped. Six miles away he stops from the city of Jerusalem. And now Sultan Salahuddin Ayubi is inside the city in Jerusalem himself. With his generals, with his people. All his people are saying, leave the city. Ya Allah, go. Because now we, will, we can't fight, you know, a pitch battle with these people. Right? So retreat, live today, to fight tomorrow. Retreat, and then we'll... He said, never will I leave this city. And the Muslims, because he knows what happened in Akka. He knows what happened in Acre. He slaughtered the entire population. He didn't want to leave. So he went to his Sheikh, Bahaudin ibn Jaddad. What do I do? What do you want me to do? Bahaudin ibn Jaddad said to him, Who is the one who gives strength? And who is the one who gives victory and defeat? He said, Allah. He said, Allah. He said, Go to the masjid. Ask Allah. Ask Allah. So Bahaudin ibn Jaddad narrates that on the day of Friday, Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi, a very thin Hafif man with his grey beard, you know, already grey. He has become so weak and fragile because of his uh, hard work for the Muslims. He stood on the masalla and he was crying. And Bahaudini Mashaddad, who is narrating, who is watching what's happening, because he's the one who wrote this. He said, he's crying and his beard is full of tears. And when he falls on the saj uh, for sajda, he's saying things. We cannot hear what exactly he's saying. He's making dua, obviously. And the Masalla was wet with his tears. This is a king, by the way. This is a king who can easily leave the city of Jerusalem, easily go away. Allah, okay, bring my belly dancing girls, bring my wine, and I will relax. Who cares about the Muslims? Let them die. But he's crying on the Masalla. He's crying, and there are tears on the Masalla. And then, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Six miles away, Richard, who came from France for one purpose to take the city of Jerusalem back. He returns, turns around and leaves. He leaves. SubhanAllah. Whether it's the power of dua or whether it's the power of uh, circumstances, whatever it was, Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi cried in front of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala never rejects the dua of a pious king. A pious king of a Zahid, a Muttaqi, someone who has taqwa, he cried to Allah, Allah accepted his du'a and he turned around and he went. 
and historians give a number of reasons as to why Richard did not besiege the city of Jerusalem. Because his generals advised him that if you besiege Jerusalem, there will be a tough fight. There is no water. There is no, there is no supply of water. There is no supply of food. You will never be able to take the city and we will lo lose our army. And Richard, he didn't even want to look at the city of Jerusalem. He came from France. He said something I cannot con conquer, I will not look at. He turned around and he went. He went back. And he also died in 1194, fighting a battle in France somewhere. In 1193, Sultan Salah Adina Yubi having done all these services for the Muslims, passed away. There are many things we can talk about. You know, it's just his Ibn Jubair, who was one of the travel one of the travelers from Spain. He came through Damascus at the time he was traveling. He did, he wasn't from the Middle East. He was from Spain. He described the situation in Damascus. This city was full of people who who were in peace and they loved the justice of Sultan Salah Adina Yubi. He praised him because he saw the justice of Sultan Salah Adina Yubi. Even non-Muslim scholars have praised him throughout the centuries. Uh, you know, even Dante, Dante who wrote his Divine Comedy, Dante Alighiri, you know when he talked about Sultan Salah Adina Yubi, he didn't put him in Jahannam. He put him in limbo, you know. He couldn't send him to Jahannam because he was too good to be in Jahannam. So he put him in limbo. He couldn't be in paradise. He couldn't because he was not a Christian. He couldn't be in Jahannam. He was too good. So he put him in the limbo, in the middle. Dante Alaziri in his uh, divine comedy. And even today, I mean, Karen Armstrong, I already told you what she said. So Sultan Salah Adina Yubi was remembered uh, by Muslims as well as non Muslims in good terms because of his character and the services he did for Islam. And there's a lot more I can say about him. But for today, I think this will be enough. Time uh, is uh, very limited on our part. Jazakumullah khair for listening. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. If there are any questions, please ask. <coughs> yes, please. Regarding Richard Lionheart and Salahuddin Ayyubi, was there any interaction between the two? Because uh, people seem to say that there was a, an, an understanding. But the reality of it is you have a Muslim and you have a non-Muslim. Yeah. And the reality of the non-Muslim is, like you said, he's come from killing 3,000 Muslims. Yeah. So the reality of it is it's a perfect thought. You would never want to show any good like that, any sort of mercy for yeah. killing the Muslim. Yeah. Yeah, true. Richard was a huge enemy of Islam and Muslims. Uh, he didn't care about Muslims and their lives. He killed 3,000 of them in one day. And Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi was well aware of that. But at the same time, Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi had his principles. When Muslims took back one of the cities from Crusaders, they went crazy. Because they wanted to avenge what happened in Acre. Okay, they really wanted revenge. They were wild, bloodthirsty Muslims. And Sultan Salah Adina Yubi couldn't control his army. He was stopping them, telling them, don't do this. This is not us. We are not like them. We are not, we are different. I am not Richard. He was I'm not Richard. We are Muslims. We have our principles. If they commit crimes, we don't commit crimes. This is why there is a difference between us and them. Okay? And this applies even today. We Muslims have rules, principles. You know, if they rape, we can't rape. If they kill children, we can't kill children. Okay, if they bomb populations, we can't do that. We are Muslims. We have our boundaries. We have our limits, right? So Sultan Saladino Yubi had his principles, and due to his principles, he said, no matter what this man is, he is the leader, and I am the Muslim leader. I, I am to be dignified and graceful. So he sent his physician to him when he was sick. Richard once he sent him his physician, go and treat him. You know, instead of telling him. Get lost, who are you? You killed 3,000 Muslims, I don't want to see your face. No, he was graceful, you know. He sent his physician to them. So with leaders, you talk like leaders, even though the leaders may be a bunch of mass murderers and killers, you know. This is why, you know, when uh, Modi went to, recently, he went to Emirates, and the rulers of Emirates, you know, were, uh, you know, welcoming him and treating him nicely. Uh, this thought came to my mind, you know, why are, why are they treating this man like that? He is responsible, like Richard, he killed 3,000 Muslims in Gujarat. No, if not directly, not by his orders, but he was passively involved, you know, he was there. He was the governor of the state, he could do anything. He could punish all those police people watching, standing and watching, seeing Muslims being burnt alive and raped, right? But they treated him nicely, they welcomed him. 
Uh, then Sultan Salahuddin Ayubi came to my mind that he, he, did, he did the same with Richard. You know? Yes, please. That time situation and this time situation, uh, when you compare, um, how you are going to say, because of the Syria, because you are involved in that, this country, that time also and this time also. So. Compa comparison? Yeah, There's no mean? comparison. There's no comparison. It was Islam, the Quran. Okay, what made the Arabs special? Who were the Arabs before Islam? Okay, no one wanted to know the Arabs. The Persians and the Romans didn't care about the Arabs. <laughs> Arabs were in the desert. Okay, fine, they are good poets. You know, they have Makkah, they have their trade, no problem, yalla. Okay, but after Islam, something special about them. Quran, Allah revealed the Quran in Arabic language that established their importance. The Arabs are important because Allah revealed the Quran in their language. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose them uh, as the first uh, recipients of Islam. So that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made them special because of Islam and the Quran. Okay? So, like the Arabs, Quran made them special. If you want to be special, pick up the Quran, live the Quran, breathe the Quran, you know, and inshallah ta'ala Allah will change your state again. It's very simple. I know it's a simplistic formula I'm giving. You know, I'm not giving you the details how to do this and how to do that. You know, once you start to take that book seriously, the Quran, once you start to take it seriously, Allah will open all doors to you. Uh, listen, the Arabs, the Sahaba, had nothing like what you have today. You have this, this thing. You have cameras, you have cars, you have education, you have universities, you have books, you have libraries. The Sahaba had none of this. They, they had nothing but the camels. Some of them didn't have two cloths to cover their bodies. Look at your designer clothes today. Yeah? Look at your watches and your, uh, you know, clothes and the shoes and everything you have. Ashab rasul some of them didn't have footwear. In Bukhari, in Kitab al-Salah, we have reports that some Sahaba, they asked, Ya Rasulullah, is... <coughs> Salah acceptable in one cloth. He said, kullikum thawban. He asked them, which one of you, do you all have two pieces of cloth? <laughs> he was asking, he was shocked. Do you all have two pieces of cloth? In other words, he's asking them, you don't even have two pieces of cloth. So, you know, there's only one option for you to pray in one cloth. In some cases, Sahaba used to put the cloth on top of their body so that the lower part and the upper part is covered enough for them to pray. And then Allah, look what Allah made them and what Allah did through them. Yeah, because of that book, the Quran. And we have so much and we don't take the book seriously. So we have to stop being hypocrites. Majority of the Muslims are suffering from the disease of hypocrisy. Majority. I'm not saying this is major nifaq. This is minor, minor nifaq. Majority of the Muslims are suffering from the disease of hypocrisy. Once we start to take our book seriously and live by it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make us great once again. Otherwise, continue to suffer. Simple. It's very simple. I'm sorry if my words hurt you, but this is the truth. It doesn't hurt. Yeah, this is the truth. <coughs> the word of truth never hurt anyone. Inshallah. Most of the biographies yeah. are written by non of, of, the of, of Sultan? No, no. The latest one that I met with was by John Man. <coughs> okay. Very no, there are many. There are many biographies by non-Muslims, but there are good ones for Muslims as well. First of all, the the earliest biographies of Sultan Salahuddin Ayubi are by Muslims. One of them, the best one, is by Bahaudini bin Shaddad. Find it and read it. It's English. amazing. As it is in English. Translated. translated in English. There are two translations. Uh, there is a new one and there's an old one from the 19th century. So Bahaudini bin Shaddad. Then there is Imaduddin al Isfahani. Then we have Abu Shama. Okay? They have written on Sultan Salahuddin al Ayyubi. Okay? So then we have a recent one by uh, As Salabi. You know As Salabi? The one who has written. Uh, the biography of the Prophet ﷺ, Umar, Abu Bakr, Uthman and Ali radiallahu anhum ajma'in and then Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi he has written a biography I am not too sure if it's in English it is in English yes it is in English okay so you can find the biographies and there are many by Western academics so to get a bigger picture it's good to read around 
you know, not read one, but it's good to read around, inshallah. Khalas, we stop now. It's time for Maghrib nearly, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan for listening. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us to act upon whatever good was said. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive our mistakes. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik mashallah la ilaha illa ant. Nasatadu firuka wa natubu alayk. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum.